In this episode, you're going to learn how to get service design into an organization that doesn't even know that they need it. It's mind blowing. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Matthew Marino, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 149. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden things that make the difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Matthew Marino, the founder of the Paris-based service design studio called User.io. Now, although it's getting better, still a lot of organizations can't articulate that they need service design in order to solve some of their problems. Now, this is a challenge when you're a service design professional and want to help them. This begs the question, how do you bring service design into an organization that isn't asking for it. Well, in this episode, Matthew shares what he calls the Trojan horse approach. You'll learn about a few tested and tried ways to get your foot in the door and how you can make sure that once you're in, you're not getting stuck doing the wrong projects. If you stick around till the end of this episode, I promise you, you'll walk away with some very practical ideas that help you to open doors and get the ball rolling. If you enjoy conversations like this and want to grow as a service design professional, make sure you click that subscribe button and that bell icon because we bring a new video like this every week or so. I hope you're ready because now it's time to sit back, relax and enjoy the conversation with Matthew Marino. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. <laughs> cool. Awesome to have you on. Uh, one of the reasons we got in touch is that I haven't uh, had that many service design professionals from France on the show. Uh, so uh, that's already a super exciting thing. Uh, maybe we'll dive into some of the specific things uh, about the service design community in France, but you will also do some other interesting stuff. And uh, that will be uh, sort of the gist of uh, the story today. For the people who haven't uh, Googled your name yet and are curious what you do, could you give a brief introduction? Yeah, sure. So I'm Matthew. Um, I'm Franco-American and I'm the co-founder of a company called User Studio. So we're a service design and innovation agency based uh, in Paris, so Paris, France. And we've been around since about 2009, um, working for a variety of projects, both in like the mobility space, energy space, um, actually all different types of spaces where service design is relevant. Um, that's the gist of it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, all, uh, all places where service design is relevant. Uh, I remember that from our, from my, uh, past in the studio, like we, the industries were, were all over the place and that made it sometimes hard for people to sort of put you in a box, but that's, uh, that's okay. That's just the nature of service design. Um, Matthew, I've got a, a rapid fire question round for you. Five questions you're, uh, asked to answer them as quickly as possible. Just the first thing that comes to your mind and that way we'll get to know you a little bit <laughs> cool. better. Yeah. Are you ready? I am. <laughs> All right. The first question is, what was your first job? Oh, um, I actually sold rollerblades at a very large sports store in France um, called Decathlon. Um, yeah. I liked to rollerblade and I sold rollerblades. Yeah. Mm. Uh, cool. Uh, we have, uh, we have that store as well here in the Netherlands. Now the cool. next question is, uh, if you could be an animal, which one would you like to be? Oh, tough question. Um, I'd probably see a dolphin, you know, smart, mm. social beings. Sounds like it's a just nice animal to be. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> fair enough. Um, if you could recommend one book, which book would you recommend? Um, hmm, that's a really tough one, but I can tell you one I read fairly recently, which is, um, won't come to a surprise for, to the, you know, the design community, which was good services by Lou Down. I thought that was really interesting to have, uh, a focus on, you know, the actual outcomes and characteristics of services and less about the, uh, the approaches and methods. Yeah. 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 Definitely a book that's high on my oh. list as well. Um, next question is, um, you're currently based in Paris, but if you could work from anywhere in the world, 
where would you pick? Um, I've always had a great appreciation for like the uh, the Pacific Coast in the U.S. So somewhere along the Pacific Coast, that that'd be amazing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, okay, still possible. Uh, final question is, what was your first encounter with service design? Oh, wow. Um, I guess this probably dates back to somewhere like around 2004, 2005-ish. I think I had, um, not exactly how, but I'd heard about this company called LiveWork, um, which a lot of people in the service design community know about. Um, and I was, I just... I stumbled upon your website. I can't remember how, and I thought it was really interesting. And I, we were actually discussing an internship, which kind of fell through because it was supposed to be for one of their French clients and that did not work out for them. And so, but I guess we kept in touch. I thought it was super interesting. And that was my introduction to service design. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, so uh, that gives us a little bit more insight into who you are. And now we can transition into the topic of today. And I, uh, really loved reading through your notes and sort of uh, getting the theme of today's conversation uh, down. And um, I think you wrote something down like, let's talk about service design for organizations that don't know they need it, right? Yeah, um, I guess this is probably a, I mean, at least in France, I think it's a fairly common challenge because, um, well, Service design, you know, is fairly, I guess, unknown to many organizations. And even when it is fairly known, I think a lot of people see it as a somewhat abstract design discipline. And so there's always that question about, you know, how you actually, how are you going to actually infiltrate that organization? I'm kind of using that word on purpose. You know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, obviously, um, because they don't necessarily express their needs, like in terms of service design explicitly. Some do, more and more do, but still, still a lot of organizations do not. And so how do you actually, you know, create awareness? How do you make sure that you find those right people, projects, uh, ways in? And I think that's one of the huge challenges that we've had to work with, that we enjoy working with, and and that maybe some other service design, design designers actually share. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember um, the joke we used to make in our studio that we are a service design studio, but nobody calls us to do service design work. Like, yeah, that's kind of a classic, I think. Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um so yeah this this is going to be interesting like how do you yeah. how do you bring in service design without people actually asking for service design and how do you even start that um conversation uh how do you infiltrate um so i'm really looking forward to your examples in um sort of the notes that you had uh sketched up you also mentioned that um service design isn't really compatible with most organizations out there these days what do you mean with that yeah so i guess we could um kind of compare to what we might see for example in the digital product design space so maybe the way i would approach it was, would be to say that you know service design does not necessarily fit very naturally in organizations because well you know service design is kind of uh doesn't necessarily have like a a clear um a stakeholder that you're going to actually respond to that you're actually going to talk to maybe like we had to contrast this with like uh, digital product designers you might have like a head of product or someone like that or have a whole full product team with product owners and so you know that's someone that you can naturally talk to that you can actually and they kind of know what to expect and you know what to expect from them and i think within service design that's less clear you know there's rarely a head of service or at least it's not expressed in that way and so you have to find all these different, you know, ways in, open doors to kind of um, get your projects done. And I guess the other challenge is that, you know, services are by definition, they have to, or at least when you design the, the, the customer experience or the user experience, you have to think of things in a very, you know, cross silo way. And so that is not necessarily super well adapted to the way most organizations are, are set up. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the the lack of clear ownership and the lack of clear responsibility inside an organization that makes it really, there is no clear buyer. Of, exactly. Yeah. And and there is no real clear owner of a service design challenge. Right. It's so fragmented that so everybody owns a, a piece of the service design challenge. Yeah, for sure. Like we, we often like to say that, you know, we need to find projects that are like Trojan horse projects, you know, projects that will be a way in. They might not necessarily be explicitly like labeled service design. Some might be and more and more are. And that's obviously great. But if they're not, you kind of have to find alternative ways in. 
Yeah. So, um, and, and I guess that's uh, where uh, I would love to uh, learn from your examples. Like finding these way ins, um, it can be interesting to, to hear your uh, experience with what are some good entry points. So if, if you're not coming into the door with uh, sort of the sticker of service design, what are ways that you can actually start a conversation with an organization? Yeah, so um, I guess we have, you know, several stories um, that could kind of tune into this. And probably most of them were, you know, happened in our earlier days. So I guess anywhere between 2009 and 2015-ish, some, somewhere like that. Whereas now we're lucky enough to be in a space where service design is slightly more prevalent. Although these challenges are still very relevant and, you know, still still exist today. But maybe just to like, you know, zoom in on one. Um, for example, very initially, I guess this was around like 2009, 10, um, we had met up with an organization which still exists today, which is a super great organization called the 27th Region, which is so it's kind of like the lab for France's region. So, you know, like Google might have the Google Labs or well, France has their, uh, their own lab to kind of explore the future of local public policy. And for a bunch of reasons, they, you know, they've historically worked with a lot of service designers. And they had got some funding, some public funding that allowed them to um, create this kind of really funny format, which in the end became like service design residency. So I kind of like, you know, compare that to like an artist residency. And this was a super interesting space because it kind of gives them like this um, mandate to kind of experiment what the future of, for example, a high school might be like, you know, this is stuff that was taken care of by, by local regions. Um and so what the future of like a high school experience might be like. And what happened was that, um, you know, maybe two, three service designers or two service designers, maybe a sociologist would kind of come in. Um, they'd actually spend maybe a couple of weeks, for example, if we continue the high school example within that high school. And they'd have free range to kind of, you know, invent whatever seemed relevant uh, for the various stakeholders within this high school. And that was a super interesting way to, to work because you know, you didn't necessarily have a very clear brief. So it allowed you to work in a very, um, let's say, holistic view with a very, you know, open type mind. And you could actually kind of come and experiment the way we thought service design, at least at the time, should be uh, should be worked on in a very open-ended, uh, free way. And so that, that was like a super, I, I guess, like just like a super format to experiment things. Hmm. So the, the service design residency, uh, that's an interesting model. Um, there you have sort of public funding and uh, people are interested to experiment, to try new stuff out. And I guess that's that's always a good starting point for service design if people are open to explore and just uh, give it a try. Uh, I'm curious in that specific example, <clears throat> um, what was... Uh, not per se what was the outcome, but how do you make sure that something sticks? Because uh, yeah. it can be it can be an interesting and fun project, and everybody enjoys the experience. And you know, service design is very attractive and appealing from the outside. But then after three or six months, the project is done, and uh, sort of there is there isn't any sustainable change. Or was there? Or how did you experience that? Yeah, I think it was a bit of both. So. I guess with hindsight, these um, projects were kind of more designed to create awareness than to actually stick and be implemented per se, because at that time, like, you know, service design awareness or, or just, you know, more user centered ways of um, designing public policies were they were very nascent at the time. And so just creating those projects that would allow people to understand and what, you know, approaches, methods, tools could be used. That was already a win within itself. Um, a lot of what was done was you know, actually documenting these projects, you know, both through like, uh, for example, we document both through like video, text, and so on, and that that was very efficient. Then there was sometimes some 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 of these smaller parts of the projects that eventually started to stick, just because the fact that they were you know done locally, co-created with local stakeholders. Once we left, the people just kind of latched onto them and actually pursued them. Um, but once again, this was not necessarily made for it to, to stick in the long run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, I guess the, the, the funding model is also key here. Uh, have you seen similar 
uh, examples of service design residency in a non-public space? Um, not to my knowledge, but what I have seen is like private uh, and public partnerships to actually perf- well, actually do research projects. Um, we've had an example, uh, and this was fairly recent actually, super interesting with the Paris Metro, where there was a, um, so it was a partly EU funded project, partly funded by the, the Paris Metro itself, to kind of explore um, how, let's say, uh, you'd actually connect like an urban hub, such as Paris, uh, with, a, with an airport, um, in, at least in, um, I think this is the case in most cities in Europe, but it definitely was the case in Paris. Uh, there was no direct metro, and so there there was like a whole, you know, experiment and a whole project to kind of explore what the passenger experience might actually be like. And in this case, you know, it was more like the a partnership between private and public uh, that actually allowed this research space to open up and to and to be explored. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, going back to the question, like, what is a good starting point? Um, maybe it's. Uh, it's someone looking for a different approach and maybe they aren't per se looking for service design as an approach but service design is a different approach than they are used to right is that the case yeah i mean if we go back to like those design residencies and Mm -hmm. i think this applies to you know other spaces as well i think a lot of what people would actually latch on to is the more um bottom-up approach you know as opposed to public policies at least in france but this might be the case in other places are often very top down in the way they're designed and i think what people really tuned into here was the fact that you know it's more bottom up you'd actually work in a more co-creative way um, with the different stakeholders and that was their way in that's what they could actually understand that was 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 concrete because i guess that you know for the a lot of what the rest of design does is fairly abstract. You know, it's really fuzzy, especially in those initial uh, those initial stages of like discovery, ideation, and so on and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, thanks for highlighting that because this can be sort of like the superpower that we uh, might easily overlook. But the co-creation part, the doing stuff together, the facili- facilitating the creation process, that is like a unique characteristic of design. And when people uh, want to move away from the hi- hierarchical decision-making structures and into a more collaborative, co-creative way of working, then this is already a very good way in, I guess. Yeah, there, there, it's actually, a, like a, I always find it a funny topic, co-creation, because obviously, you know, it's very relevant for service design. A lot of service designers practice it and so on. But I found that there comes a point when, you know, that's all people remember from service design. That's all they associate it with. And you know, if we push that to like the extremes, you know, people just kind of associate that to like, you know, post-it workshops and so on and so on, which will also give us a very, you know, limited view in terms of the what the potential of service design can can actually do. Um, we'd actually, like if you, maybe to give you another story, another anecdote, um, kind of, let's say during those same years, similar years, like 2009, 2010, 11, so, so on, one of the things that we had noticed was specifically that is that you know those initial stages, creative stages, discovering creative stages were very fuzzy to most people, and so we thought maybe we can kind of like embody this within an actual tool. And in this case, we had created like a digital platform that allowed uh, people to map out the insights that were being collected, especially for like public projects. So, for example, we'd have a map like a Google Map uh, style map, and we'd be able to map out the insights. So, actually, you know, physically on the map and and then as we move to, to more of the co-creative uh, stages, we'd actually um, have this little, well, on our, our tool, we had like a toolbox, like a crayon box that actually allowed you to kind of build a little postcard with your idea. So if you said, you know, within this given uh, spot of my neighborhood, I want to have this park that'll have trees and it'll have like, you know, and so on and so on. You could actually make that up in a very simple way because you were just like clicking on icons and they would kind of pop up. And that was like a super interesting way to approach it because it actually made you know the the initial fuzzy stages of design super concrete because it transformed them into a into a tool so it was a slightly standardized tool but it kind of you know embodied them as a tool and people thought that was super interesting because it made uh it made the design process much more concrete for them so yeah yeah so what was the what 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 do you experience that people experience as the fuzzy part 
Well, I, I think it's, you know, both the, for example, the insights sometimes can be slightly unclear for them because, you know, they thought they'll think, well, you know, as designers, you might be less rigorous than, you know, sociologists or, or ethnographers and so on. But I think the real fuzzy part is more the creative part when you actually come up with ideas, new ideas, new concepts. And, you know, they know that there's going to be some type of creativity, but they don't really know what they're going to get, you know. And so if we could actually present a tool that would actually show them, you know, this is what the results might actually look like, it was super reassuring for them. Yeah. And uh, the, I want to I wanna hear more about this. So if this was reassuring, uh, what, what was the part that made them, that gave them the confidence that this was something that would bring them the outcomes that they were looking for? Well, I think it was the fact that, you know, what they were buying, at least what they, one of the things they were buying was the actual tool itself and, and kind of the framework in which we were going to implement that tool. Cause it was like a hybrid of the toolbox we were bringing, but also let's say the workshops, like the, the, the insights, uh, sorry, the user research that we were going to be doing, but also the workshops that we would be running the co-creative workshops. But, you know, the fact that there was that actual tool that kind of that we could show them and we had previous examples with that tool it was super concrete as opposed to you know what what we often do as designers which is 100 percent you know custom-led methods and approaches to whatever topic we'll be we'll be mm -hmm. uh, working on mm -hmm. but there, there was there was an interesting um kind of you know effect to that which kind of moves back to the, the co-creation topic which that i guess this was so reassuring but it also created such a big spotlight on the co-creation uh, that that's all they kind of remembered. <laughs> and so mm. in the end, you know, the huge risk was that they would just be calling us to run these uh, workshops. Uh, yeah. And that would be kind of the main focus of the project, which we thought was obviously not enough to actually, um, well, actually do service design, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that's, uh, um, that's, one way, it's the appeal of uh, sort of selling standardized processes. I'm thinking of design sprints or three-day yeah. training. Like, it's easy yeah. to sell. It's easy to buy. It's very tangible. You know what you're going to get, um, but you miss like 95% of exactly. the value. Exactly. I mean, this is, I mean, I think you've summed it up perfectly. It's the whole you know, debate around should we standardize or not our tools and methods. Um, like we strongly believe that, you know, service design is not a method in the sense that it's not like, you know, something that you can replicate in a standardized way. But on the other hand, we also understand completely that, you know, selling something that's fairly abstract and it's super, you know, custom made in many cases is extremely uh, abstract and unclear for a lot of uh, uh, clients. Yeah. Yeah, clients aren't well. There, and I, I love to have this conversation, and it's a balance because uh, when we uh, apply and put on our empathy uh, hat, then we sort of have to understand that clients are used to buying things in a different way, and sort of how can we cater for that and help them to ease that, uh, to to uh, to close that gap or to to make that leap of faith uh, smaller for them to to buy into this. Uh, I want to I want to cycle back to one of the things you mentioned uh, and that is um uh, they latched on to co-creation or maybe in, in a different yeah. thing they will latch on to the design sprint um how do you make sure that that's not the the only thing people will sort of know you for and that they <laughs> will be open for uh, getting the rest yeah it's a tough question um I guess um, what generally happens, oh, so this will be an indirect way to answer your question, but um, what we often find is that, you know, when we start a project, a lot of people kind of, you know, be fairly worried. I, I don't, the word might be slightly too strong, but, you know, they'll, they'll be slightly worried until we actually um, start producing deliverables and deliverables with which might be some, you know, initial sketches that will express like a user journey or some type of concept or something a little more concrete. And so, you know, there's always those initial stages where, you know, we might do some re user research if that's relevant within the project, or there might be a few workshops, but that, you know, that'll be somewhat concrete to them. At least the co-creation part will be, you know, fairly, uh, they know that that's relevant. 
But I think what really makes a lot of sense is once we actually start showing those initial sketches and then you're like, ah, okay. I actually, you know, I realize where this could actually go in terms of a project. And this is to an extent where, um, I mean, we've kind of, we've kind of realized that this was so strong that um, I think at one point, I can't remember exactly when, but we kind of said that, you know, in the future, we can't really show any user research without showing any initial sketches because or else it'll just be too disconnected. And so even though like some projects, you know, I guess a lot of people experience this, sometimes people don't buy the whole service design approach, they buy pieces. So even for people who will, clients who will buy, for example, um, uh, a user research project, or at least a strongly focused user research project, we always try to associate some type of ideation just so that they realize, you know, that these things are not disconnected. And I think those are one of the ways in which that they really uh, go beyond um, the cliches, which are maybe user research or co-creation. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because this is a topic that has been addressed on the show in the recent episode, weeks, months. Uh, and that is when you do something as a service design professional, it seems to be very smart and very strategic to always show like the bigger picture to put everything into yeah. context. And like, um, today we're doing this, but this is part of like this roadmap and this roadmap can be next month, yeah. next year, like next three years to always be highlighting that story. Yeah, for sure. I mean. I think it's always super important. And I guess that's what we try to always do as service designers is kind of always, you know, go back and forth between like the helicopter view and then the super zoomed view. And yeah, as you were saying, always put things into perspective. And that gives, um, I guess, clients and all people who are non-designers just like say a, a general outlook on where the project can go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what's really important is that uh, we also are very aware of building this story like having asking these questions and not just rushing into a project and just doing that just facilitating that user research you're just doing that uh, idea generation workshop that you always try to understand from the client's perspective like okay how does this fit in how do, how is it helping uh the organization how is it helping you achieve your goals and then like what's the next step yeah like, I don't know, you know, if maybe this is something that you've experienced in the past or we often like to think in terms of, you know, who's our accomplice within the client organization. And, and that person is often, you know, not necessarily, it could be a designer, but not necessarily, but it's often someone who's, let's say, more familiar with the design process than, uh, than other people who are part of the project. And they often help us to build exactly what you're saying you know, kind of like the design of the design, so to speak. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we, uh, I think it's two episodes ago that we talked about the service design whisperer. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> very similar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which was which was a great, uh, great analogy. Um, so, uh, okay, co-creation could be a way in bottom-up approach. Uh, getting in with a tool or method or framework could be a, a, a good starting point. Yeah. Any other examples that you think might be useful to share? Yeah, there's one that I, we found to be very, very efficient, um, which uh, I guess I could compare it to like building a concept car. <laughs> so I'll explain. Um, every so often, we'll design what we call concept projects, which, you know, I think designers are fairly familiar with what this is. Um, all, all types of designers might have done this. So it's a, a project that is not done for a client. It's kind of it's, you know, you take a topic and then you actually make a, a project out of it, a design proposal. And then we, you know, show it, communicate it, um, kind of broadcast it to the world, so to speak. And we see, you know, if people actually find that interesting and that's kind of a way to, we use that as a conversation starter with them. So I'll give you an example of one that was fairly, actually, I think, pretty successful for us. Um, we had decided to design a, uh, to redesign a phone bill. So, you know, your typical phone bill, you know, I mean, everyone knows what it looks like, but there are many ways in which it could look like in the future. And in this case, we had, I won't go into the details, but we wanted to redesign it in a fairly more infographic way, um, to give people more transparency in terms of what they're actually spending, um, and, and you know, what their consumption actually is. So we had, you know, redesigned this phone bill, uh, made it look pretty nice. And there was a whole concept that revolved around it. And we had made this one minute video that kind of presented the whole concept and obviously the phone bill itself. 
kind of like the videos that you'd have, um, you know, on the uh, front page of uh, that a startup might have on their front page presenting their their proposal. And we we kind of um, how should I put it? Put this into the world uh, through newsletters and sent it out to a bunch of people, and it actually created this huge buzz. It was uh, picked up by magazines. Uh, mostly Anglo-Saxon magazines, uh, which was kind of funny, um, like Fast Co-Design, for example. And they were often tech or design-related magazines. But it also just created like a huge buzz within our, our network, uh, our local network here in France. And uh, we know that it was sent around to, you know, a bunch of telcos, utilities, any, anyone who had bills, you know, anywhere from like an energy provider to a telco. And this was kind of used, I think, I mean, this is my interpretation, but I, I kind of have you know good evidence to, to suggest that this is what happened is that people would actually use this as like a demonstration tool um, within your organization to say, oh, you know, this is what we could actually do in some near future. What do you think? And then in the end, you know, they'd come knocking on our door and they'd say, oh, we have a project that might be very, fairly similar to this one. Maybe we can do something together about it. Yeah. So what's interesting about this uh, concept project example um a few things like you might argue that what is a service design studio doing redesigning a phone build because mm, true. isn't that isn't that <laughs> a part of a graphic designer true, or true. a <laughs> copywriter like people you might you might end up confusing people how did you make sure that did what happened like which, which story got out into the world yeah that that's a good question um you're right i mean they could have just seen us as like graphic designers um maybe i should mention why we actually decided to zoom in on a phone bill so phone bills i mean are are a very symbolic touch point in the sense that um they're the main interface, I'm using the word interface you know, in a very large sense, between, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a service organization or especially utility or a telco and the customer. And often what happens is that's kind of like the only interaction you might actually have with, uh, with that telco, which is not necessarily the nicest one because, you know, they're asking you for money. So there might be a different way to actually uh, go about that relationship. So we thought that it was, you know, symbolically, it was kind of the touch point that could also embody represent the rest of the philosophy of that that uh, telco or service provider might actually uh, offer their clients and um so that i guess that was one of the main reasons and then, and then what we did is we thought that you know kind of like in a movie you might have a main character and the, and the movie might focus on that main character but the movie might be about more than that character well we kind of needed a main character to kind of think about what the future of this uh, tele telecommunications service could look like and that main character was the phone bill. So we thought that was like a very strong narrative way to actually, you know, portray that. But obviously in our concept, we were actually showing more than the phone bill. We were showing all these other different touch points, just that we needed that main one. So people wouldn't think, oh, you know, this is super complicated. Where, do, where should we actually start? You know? mm. Yeah, you take something that is so common that everybody can relate to, where everybody yeah. uh, has some uh, probably strong emotion uh, towards. And um, uh, I'm almost like you made a movie, but what I was seeing is almost a manual or a reading guide or yeah. reading instructions to what are you seeing here? You're not seeing a phone bill. You're seeing a representation of a human-centered way of working. Exactly. And, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of like it's, you know, the tail end of the service, but it gives you, let's say, a, um, yeah, like a, a first idea of what the rest of the service could be like. It was designed in the same way as that phone bill was designed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other question I have around this, um, which might also uh, pop up to somebody who's listening right now, um, this seems like a pretty significant investment on your end. Like how did you how did you justify that? <laughs> Yeah, it, it was. Um, obviously, this was you know done on our own time. Uh, I guess it was just an investment that we thought was relevant enough to make sense. And you know, the the advantage of choosing something like a phone bill is that you know anyone who might be working for a bank or or an energy company or any type of utility or large serving service organization will have that type of touch point. And so it's not like it's super niche, even though we done it, we had done it for a telco. You know, it was a, 
a fiction is kind of telco that the client didn't actually exist, but it was something that many different service providers we thought could relate to. And so it made sense to make that investment because, you know, it would actually be able to talk to a lot of different people. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I guess it's a way uh, to market your services by showing what they sure. potentially can do rather than talking about them, like demonstrating. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it, you know, it often comes back to this debate that we have in uh, service design communities, which are, do we want to talk about the tools and methods? Possibly. I mean, that's always very relevant, but maybe not exclusively. We also kind of want to talk about what the actual results and outcomes might look like. And I think for a lot of, of our clients and a lot of people who could be interested in service design, that is something that's a little less abstract to them. Yeah. And, and I still like I the biggest challenge I see here is like, how do you make sure that people don't get hung up on the actual artifact and sort of understand? Because... Like if you can redesign a phone bill and make it more use, like rep make it represent the user centered philosophy of an organization right. and do it without, <laughs> without a budget, without like, having access to customers, like you skipped a lot of, uh, uh, you took a lot of shortcuts, which is oh, great yeah. for, yeah. for the demonstration, <laughs> but it might also raise some, um, like how hard can it be or suspicion, like yeah yeah i see what you mean um well i i guess you know uh, maybe one of the more challenging parts is actually you know getting your foot in the door and once that happens and you actually start the conversation then obviously maybe more traditional ways of creating awareness might need to you mm -hmm. know, come in and, and and actually do the job but yeah that that is maybe one of the pitfalls that people will be like oh well, this, this sounds super simple uh, you know you could do this for cheap or for in a super short time and yeah, it's often yeah. more complex than it seems. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, uh, but uh, that's that's a that's that's like a second problem to solve. Let's let's yeah, first exactly. get a seat at, exactly. at the table. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and uh, and I guess um, w what I'm getting out of this is um, you have to pick something that where you can sort of provoke and sort of where the pain is pretty obvious, like where you can find a very strong lack of human centeredness like if you can sort of push on that uh touch point in this case then you can make a pretty decent story yeah for sure i mean i think that that was probably the success of it is that you know really a lot of people could relate to it mm -hmm. yeah um did you did this inspire you to do any other follow-ups or was this like okay let we this work but we're going to try other methods uh, in the future? Um, you know, we did do follow-ups, maybe with topics that were a little more niche. And so they didn't necessarily have, uh, let's say, the, the same success or the same widespread following. Although within their niche fields, I think they were, they were effective. So this was something that we would do, you know, every so often. Obviously, it can only be once every, you know, year max, if not every two years, because as you were suggesting, you know, it involves, well, it involves a lot of investment. But yeah, we do feel that this is something that's pretty efficient and that I think a lot of service designers could uh, put into practice. Yeah, mm, yeah that's interesting. Um, and uh, there are so many, like if you just look around you, I think in one of the, if not the first service design show episode, I think it was, uh, no, I'm not going to quote this person but it, because I don't <laughs> recall exactly, but uh, the, the sort of gist was redesign something that makes you angry. Like ah, if, okay. take that as a starting point and <laughs> <good> um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's not so hard. Like there are so many shitty services out there that you should be able to pick something. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, but I guess once again, the challenge is always, you know, how do you find something that's not so niche that, you know, only two or three people will pick up on it mm -hmm. um, yeah. because or else your investment, you know, is very, I mean, you know, it's highly uh, specialized and. But yeah, I definitely like that way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, okay, so this was another approach uh, to uh, getting in uh, the Trojan horse. Um, yep. Anything else that you feel we should uh, mention? Yeah, there's, um, uh, as I, was, I think I suggested this previously, we work uh, often for the Paris Metro. Um, and this has been, has been like an ongoing, absolutely amazing relationship that we've had for, I guess, many years now. And, um, 
And one of the things that we've observed, you know, over the space of maybe five, six, seven years, I can't remember the exact amount, is that, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to approach things on all fronts. Uh, so let me make that a little more explicit. For example, sometimes uh, we'll get like, you know, uh, projects that will be explicitly expressed as service design projects, like, you know, those very holistic, uh, looking at the entire passenger journey uh, type projects. Um, one example is that is that research project I was mentioning. And these are super interesting in the sense that they create like a very good framework for having that, let's say, holistic view of what the, the you know, the entire ecosystem should look like. And they're also like great demonstration tools of how we can actually approach things, um, especially in the ways that we work, but also in terms of, you know, where the Paris Metro could be going in the future. But this is also combined with projects that are more, let's say, um, uh, smaller scoped, maybe more traditional, not in a negative sense, but more traditional design projects that might actually um, have us design maybe one touch point. So it can be like signage projects or user interface projects or those types of projects, which is something that we, 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 we work on on a fairly regular basis. And what often happens is that, you know, we might work, let's say on an app, on this piece of signage and so on, or, or like wayfinding tools. And although these projects might be individual projects, once you work on one, then a second one, then a third one, and so on, then you start, you know, connecting the dots between all of them, although they were not necessarily, you know, meant to be connected in that way. And so it helps us connect the dots and make sure that, you know, when you're designing, let's say, this uh, um, element of signage, you're actually thinking about how it actually connects or relates to the other pieces of signage that are in the metro stop. Uh, that are in you know the larger ecosystem of the of the Paris Metro, and so it's a very more it's a much more indirect way of working um, on service design, but I think that it's a very you know efficient and and just a very uh, just a great way of working because mm. in the end it gives very concrete results, um, and it allows you once you start having two three four projects to have that holistic view. Uh, uh, again, w what I found interesting about this is that sort of uh, service design is intertwined with the approach of uh, like, like solving any challenge. And uh, that is that is like almost the ultimate form of uh, uh, democrat democratization of service design. Like um, you're doing it now as a service design studio, but ideally like the people who would be working on signage or uh, the app would also have this approach. And then it's sort of, it, it's in the veins, it's in the fabric of the organization. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening uh, within the Metro is that, you know, more and more people are looking at from that perspective. And therefore, you know, even though they might work on this specific touch point, they'll always have that greater frame of mind when they actually work on things. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the the conclusion is we don't need service design professionals to do service design. I think uh, that they have a specific role and uh, they won't go away. But in a lot of cases, uh, let let other people do it. Yeah, I mean, uh, as your I mean, your services are just so huge, so gigantic that no one service designer could actually, you know, or even one team of service designer could actually have the full spec work on the full spectrum. So I think you're right. You know, it just makes sense to kind of, let's say, send that philosophy out in the world, e even though maybe certain projects will require, I still, I still strongly believe in that will require, um, you know, very precise service design work, you know, yeah, you know, you know, like the trained professional, the trained service design professional won't go away anytime soon. But uh, the like, there are different levels of maturity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, one thing I was curious about in this example is, um, I was I was thinking like, okay, so you're a service design studio. Like, how the hell do you get invited to do a signage project? Because you're like. Yeah. You're not the expert with regards to signage or with regards to digital interfaces. Like, right. how, how do you get in from that angle? Yeah, we, we've always had like, a, I guess, a, a, I guess two different, not, not two different, but two complementary positionings. So one is, you know, clear cut service design and the other one is more in the UX, UI, digital product design space. So that definitely makes us very legitimate to actually enter those projects. Um, 
And once again, we, we think that this is often like, you know, a very Trojan horse way of entering those projects because, you know, they, they could have theoretically um, called a very traditional UX UI studio to actually do the work. But they start realizing that it's interesting to have someone who knows how to look at things, you know, on both levels, the very zoomed in, um, you know, working on one touch point point a little, but at the same time, having that helicopter view of how the, the global ecosystem needs to work. So I guess it's by, you know, having those two, the team with the two skill sets that actually um, makes us, you know, that allows us to actually enter those uh, different projects. Yeah, it's, uh, you have an expertise which organizations know how to procure. They know how to buy it, when to buy it, who needs it, and then that opens up doors. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, I definitely think that, you know, in our early years, that was very helpful. But what's extremely, I'd say, you know, satisfying now is that we see more and more um, projects that are specifically labeled, you know, service design. So their maturity is growing and mm. that's extremely, uh, you know, satisfying to see. Yeah. Mm. Um, from these examples that you gave, uh, and I'm sure you have many more of doing uh, the, the service design Trojan projects and <laughs> uh, bringing service design into organizations who don't know that they actually need it. Right. Um, what would be some of the most important lessons you learned along the way? Yeah, this is, um, I was kind of reflecting on this when, you know, you initially asked me the question and I think one of the conclusions I came to, which is still a, a long, uh, we still have a long, you know, long road to actually keep, uh, walking down, which is learning how to speak our client's language. So this is not nothing that's particularly surprising, but I just think it's very hard to do as designers. Uh, you know, learning how to think like our clients think, learning their language. And, you know, the more you get to know about like a specific sector, for example, we're getting to know way, a lot more about the mobility sector. That's one of them. But like, for example, also the healthcare sector, the more you're actually able to understand the thing through their lens, you know, their point of view. And that I think is probably the single one, you know, most useful, uh, I guess, learning that I've had in these past years. Not that it was particularly complicated to actually realize, but it's just very complicated to implement. What may, what would you say makes it so complicated? Well, you know, it's 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 a I guess it's a question of time and education. Um, a lot of us were trained as you know formal designers. We went to like industrial design school or interaction design school, and so. I guess we were kind of like trained, if not even like, you know, formatted, so to speak, in a certain way. And um, and I'm, I'm often very surprised, you know, about how, although this is not new for me, but I just always find it amazing that, you know, people don't think about projects in a very user-centered way. Um, and so that that's one of the things that's, you know, hard to go about. And then, then the other thing is that it just involves a lot of time. Uh, to learn all the jargon, to learn, to understand the very complex stakes. Um, mm. Yeah, it takes time. Yeah. And, and um, this, is, this is a key message which I absolutely believe in. And uh, I, don't, I don't think you can be an um, effective service design professional when you don't learn how to learn the language of yeah. your client. And for, this, for the single reason that um, we have to operate uh, at a higher level of abstract abstraction uh, yeah. abstraction inside the organization like um when you're sort of dealing uh just with a touch point level with all due respect like you if you're making signage you're making the app or doing the copywriting like you don't have to get involved in the politics and the processes and the strategy of the organization per se like if you're just a great graphic designer you can stick it out pretty long but as a service designer you want to influence decision making. You want to influence roadmaps, and you you just won't be taken seriously if you don't speak the language of the business. Yeah, that that's very true. And I think you know, as you as we deep dive within uh, certain sectors, um, then that's you know that's what ends up happening, and you actually start learning it, and you actually become more legitimate. You know, having said that, there's always a uh, something that we've never wanted to stray away from because we find that it's often very convincing is that, you know, we don't want to forget the way in which we actually know how to design touch points because although this might be more of a traditional way of looking at service design, 
we often feel that, you know, in the end, it's just super convincing. You know, once you show someone the actual touch point, which, you know, in, in, in a lot of like mobility, healthcare and so on spaces, they're actually very complex within themselves. And, um, and once you actually spend time around those and, and design them and show your clients the, the actual end result, I think that's also one of the ways in which you become very convincing. Although you're right, you cannot just do that. That's not, mm-hmm. not sufficient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, speaking or learning the language of your client is one of the things, uh, the lessons you learned along the way. Were there any other things that you think yeah, would there, be important to share? There's one which I would say we're you know still not very good at, to be quite honest. And the more I talk to designers, the more I feel like no one is very comfortable with it. Um, which is, you know, how do you actually evaluate uh, your projects? How do you, so is it through KPIs? Is it through um, quali- qualitative evaluation? But do you have a formal way of actually evaluating your projects? And are you able to embed that evaluation, you know, from the, from the go of the project, from the start of the project? And I think that's something that we're currently learning how to do very, you know, v- very early stages. And I'm always surprised when I talk to, you know, people who deal specifically with evaluation, not necessarily evaluation of design projects, but let's say evaluation of you know, public policy projects or strategy projects. And once you start deep diving with them, they realize that, you know, no one has found the right method to or the right way to go about evaluating a design project. So I feel like everyone's still kind of, you know, experimenting in that space. But if we had maybe experimented earlier, I think we would have learned a lot. Um, a lot more sense. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's 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 an interesting topic, and I think there is already quite some uh, good knowledge and theories around yeah. this. But it just doesn't. Uh, my hunch is that service design professionals, and maybe designers in general, aren't that interested in evaluating. Yeah, uh, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Like we we'd rather do the work than spend our time counting numbers and that. Uh, well, and I don't think that's a good approach, by the way, but yeah. It, it's possible, but maybe the, the thing that I've seen more recently, especially in the public sector space, is that um, there are, for example, agencies or professionals that have that expertise. So maybe not necessarily to evaluate design projects, but to evaluate, you know, projects within themselves. And maybe it's more about, you know, finding ways to collaborate with those professionals. And that way they can actually do the work in a very professional way and leave the designers do the design work. So may- maybe one of the routes that we might be exploring or that, you know, service designers could explore if they're not already doing this is finding ways to kind of, you know, embed them within the projects fairly early on. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this is going to be a call to action. So uh, if somebody is listening to this and has some ideas who might be an interesting person to get on the show, uh, who's probably not a designer, but is uh, sort of experienced with evaluating uh, design projects, uh, leave a comment. You can do that on the video or even the Spotify episode if you're listening to this uh, right now. So yeah, I'd love to have that conversation. Um, so uh, Matthew is sort of heading towards the uh, end of our conversation. How would you summarize the last 45 minutes? Well, um... I guess the um, maybe the main point maybe we're trying to make here was that you know you have to kind of be creative in terms of the ways that you're going to actually get service design into organizations because there's no you know clear road clear path to actually embedding service design and so maybe one of the toughest challenges is actually you know designing your path into the the service design world you know mm. yeah. Mm. You, it's like when you're picky and you, when you're very dogmatic about how it has to be done, then you'll have a pretty hard time getting a lot of work. And I think like uh, you, there is you can make an argument for not watering down the approach. Like that's that's <laughs> I guess the risk. But on the other hand, like if 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 you don't get to do the work, then nothing will happen. Nothing eventually. will happen so exactly. Nothing yeah. will happen. So. Uh, finding that right balance like making sure that it's not watered down but you still get clients comfortable enough to make that leap of faith in order to engage with you that's i guess yeah it comes with experience for sure yeah um 
are there any interesting links that we can uh, add to the show notes? I guess the uh, uh, phone bill example should be out there somewhere. Yeah, um, I guess we could add the phone bill example. We could add that uh, toolbox example uh, yep. that I mentioned previous, uh, previously. Um, maybe those are the two main ones, I'd, I'd say. Yeah. yeah, sure. And if people want to reach out to you uh, to continue this conversation, what's the best way? Sure. So um, my email is, I guess, through email, probably. Um, so my email is Marino. So my family name, M-A-R-I-N-O at user.io. And you can find all our info or all our work at user.io. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, watch out because you'll be getting a lot of emails. <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> also, I really enjoyed this conversation, uh, the Trojan horse approach to service design. Uh, I think a lot of people will benefit uh, from it and it's really recognizable. And I think it's good to share some uh, of these uh, best practices. So thanks uh, for coming on, Matthew. Thanks for sharing the French uh, perspective on service design uh, partially here. And I hope we'll get uh, many more people from uh, France to follow you on uh, on the show. Thanks for your invitation, Mark. It's great talking to you. Do you have an example of how to bring service design into an organization that doesn't even know it needs it? Leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.